Great. Um, so we are starting. I've started recording. Um, welcome, everyone, to this month's Health Tech Entrepreneurs Meetup. Today's uh, topic is regulatory strategy, navigating the medical device environment from startup to market. Um, so these meetup, uh, meetup series are a space where we can learn how to apply concepts that we learn to actual real life. And it's a chance for everyone to discuss their own experiences and share tips and advice. So if there's anything you'd like to hear or anything you'd like to speak on, uh, please let me know. And uh, we also have a Slack workspace. So if you're not on there and you'd like to go on there, um, please let me know and uh, keep sending feedback because we, we do uh, take, uh, take the feedback into account and we try to evolve. Uh, we're also revamping our meetups this year. So I'm trying to advertise more widely to get the attendance up. So please share these events with your network. Um, you can also, uh, we've also uh, got, uh, sorry, I'm trying to copy a link here. Uh, yeah, so we're also, um, have an events page now on the MDC website. You can check out um, upcoming events and topics. Um, also, we have sponsors now. So I'm going to, here we go. So here we go. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, uh, Fulton Bank, uh, Cooley, a law, um, law firm, and uh, Tedco are our current sponsors. So if you'd like to sponsor us, uh, support these meetups, uh, please let me know. You'll be displayed, your logo will be displayed at every meetup this year, and you'll also be advertised on the MDC website. All right. So yes, um, today's topic is, as I mentioned, uh, is regulatory strategy. Uh, and our speaker is Jack Kent. He's the Chief Commercialization Officer at Coap Tech uh, at, at LaunchPort, as you just mentioned. Um, he's also the Principal Consultant at Blue Crab Device Consulting. Uh, he has extensive experience as a medical device executive, leading a range of products to market both here and abroad. And he's also passionate about fostering economic uh, growth in Maryland through the development of novel medical technologies. Also, there'll be a bonus. Uh, one lucky attendee will win a free one hour session with Jack. So, um, at, yay, <laughs> at the end of the session, please email me. I, I put my email um, in, the, in the chat. Uh, please email me at the end of the session with what you'd like to learn from Jack and the first person to reach me will win a one hour session with Jack. So thank you, Jack, for, for being generous with your time. Okay, so now I'd like to do our usual intros. Um, so uh, I can go first. So um, everyone, please introduce, uh, when I call on uh, call your name, uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, let us know what you're working on. Um, if you're looking for something, if you're having problems, or if you wanna share something, uh, now would be a great time and hopefully we can all connect. Um, so I can start, I'm Nao. I am the founder and CEO of Neurosonics Medical. We are developing a focused ultrasound device for minimally invasive neurosurgery. We're also um, a portfolio company at MDC, uh, Maryland Development Center, which is a startup studio in downtown Baltimore, focusing on uh, building health and medical technology companies. So if you'd like to come check us out, please let me know. Um, everyone's vaccinated now, so we'd love to have people over. Um, I also recently became the VP of Business Development at MDC, and it is a lot of fun. Um, all right, so next person, uh, Jack, I'll come to you at the end when you speak. Uh, Chris Sarlo, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Chris Salo with Life Science Wealth. Um, I'm just here uh, just to kind of see, you know, what's kind of going on in, in the Maryland, uh, you know, biotech space. Uh, what I do with clients and with companies is I assist uh, with their wealth needs. I'm uh, obviously specially uh, designed just to deal with life science companies uh, in the DMV area. Um, if anybody ever has any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me, but look forward to uh, hear what everybody has going on. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Chrissy, if you're on. Yeah, hi, I'm Chrissy. I'm a postdoc at Hopkins getting, looking into starting a company with our microfluidic technology that works to detect rare biomarkers. Um, so we're looking to apply this to detection of ovarian cancer um, or to the detection of um, bacteria uh, as it applies to sepsis. Wonderful. Uh, Cyrus? Yes, I am Cyrus. Uh, it's Ahmed Mogadam. I'm uh, a uh, product development expert, been working in uh, various industries for a long time. And uh, my company, RPM Tech, does uh, uh, product development, engineering services, prototyping services. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dan? 
Hi everyone. Um, I'm just here just to uh, you know listen and and, and learn. I'm a, a co-founder and CEO of a very early stage uh, dental AI startup. So, in, in in kind of parallel kind of areas of perhaps biotech in, in its traditional sense. So, but I'm 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 looking to just learn and just see what what we can. I mean, what you guys know about you know software as a medical device and how that may evolve you know and evolve into the future of digital health. So, uh, excited to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Feng? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is Feng Tao. Um, I have been an entrepreneur for many, many years, uh, more than two decades, um, involving a couple of the companies. Um, and most recently, I have been a consultant for a lot of startups to develop a small business grants. Um, a little over a month ago, I was become a full-time employee in a, one of the institutes. So I'm no longer as an entrepreneur myself for the moment, but I still like to uh, keep one foot, at least my ear open to the community. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Jonathan? Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan Caballero. I am a software developer, not an entrepreneur, but just I've been very curious lately um, I did work right out of college with Epic, so I think a lot of my like curiosity is more with like EHR and stuff, and just listening in to see uh, what's going on in the in the business, I guess, in the industry and in Maryland specifically. Wonderful, thank you. All right, uh, Kathleen. Hi, I'm Kathleen Lacar. Uh, I'm at, uh, out on the West Coast. Um, I work as a nurse in a couple different roles with um, both the clinical side and also research um, on specifically inherited cardiomyopathies. And then I also work with startups um, as an advisor for re a, a remote care um, platform and a innovative medical device, and then also with Medtronics. So I kind of have my hands in a lot of different things because I'm interested in a lot of different things. And I feel like these groups are great for kind of hearing what's going on. Awesome. And Kellyanne, if you're on. Uh, hi, yes, let me see. I'll turn my camera real quick. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> so uh, my name is Kellyanne, watch that it. And uh, the majority of my professional experience was working at the FDA in a variety of roles. I first started within their regulatory uh, research group and that's how I met a friend of mine who works with MDC, uh, Stephen Restaino, and um, that's how I got connected to this group. Um, but so from the research side, I moved on to the regulation of the pre-market regulation of medical devices, specifically neurological and physical medicine devices. I served as a lead reviewer as well as a team lead there. Um, but interestingly, I have uh, moved on to a different opportunity and I'm actually currently um, working, or I'm actually studying as a nursing, nursing student at Johns Hopkins right now. But um, because of my professional experience at the FDA and engineering background before uh, pursuing nursing, I um, have always been very interested in innovation. And um, I think this is a great group to stay connected to that. Awesome, thanks so much. So I think I got everyone. So I'll hand it over to Jack. Yes, thank you guys for that introduction. That helps a lot. And, um, and Kelly and I, it's good to have a former FDA person on the phone, uh, but hopefully I, I, I'm not planning on saying anything derogatory about FDA, but, um, but sometimes it is, it is navigating a difficult pathway. Um, so, so I'm glad to, <laughs> glad to know that you've moved to nursing and uh, I'm, I'm hopefully not offending you too much. But, <laughs> but to give you a little bit of background on me, um, I, I study as, as, as a bioengineer so I've, I've always loved medical devices from, from the beginning of, of my professional career. Uh, I came out of college and worked with a regulatory consulting group, mostly doing pre-market uh, consulting. So that, that means that I was helping companies get their FDA clearance or FDA approval for different types of medical devices. And it ranged in a variety of therapeutic areas. So, so we really covered almost everything. And we tend to have two types of um, companies that we worked with. Either we were part of a regulatory team for like the Boston Scientific, Boston Scientifics and Medtronics and whatever and on a very complicated case, like running a regulatory FDA panel, or we worked with startups and we were working with 
one or two people that were passionate about changing medicine and changing um, one particular aspect, or they were an engineer, you know, an aerospace engineer that came up with something that could be applied to medicine. And they had no idea what, what they were doing, but they had a uh, passion and they had a solution for a problem that existed in medicine. And I really gravitated toward that side of, of the business. And eventually I went back and, and went back to school that is, and got my MBA and MPH at, at Hopkins. Um, and since graduating from that program, uh, I've basically been working in the startup land. So I, I joined uh, Clear God Medical, which is, is another Baltimore company that still exists today. Um, and in, on sort of the, the side, I was also working with Tedco. They had an MD PACE program that worked with uh, local groups to provide regulatory support. And I worked with that to help various companies in the area get, get through FDA processes, um, whether that be um, designing a study, doing a risk analysis, getting ISO certifications for whatnot, or getting a, a 510K or a IDE or that sort of thing. Um, and now I'm working with Coaptech, uh, another Baltimore group. Um, the, both this, this particular device is a, is a physical device and it's, it's meant, it's procedural. So it's one time sterilized and, and exists for a procedure. Um, but I also have a lot of experience working with software. So a lot of decision support software, a lot of software that exists on, on, on hardware, um, uh, telehealth, that sort of thing. I've, I've worked with a lot of companies that have tried to navigate that space. Um, and from, from both the aspect of, hey, we're just providing information to a doctor to, okay, well, maybe we're providing a screening tool or maybe we're providing a diagnosis or maybe we're providing some sort of AI smart analysis of something to help a physician um, do something and or make a decision on it. And so I've, I've, I've helped different companies navigate what their regulatory picture might look like. Um, it, is, it is something that is sort of a changing dynamic with FDA right now because they're always sort of trying to catch up to the times and technology is moving faster than they are, um, which is not their fault um, at all. But it's one of these things where it's constantly changing. And as the entrepreneur who often sees regulatory as a hurdle, as a bur burden to get past for whatever it is, commercial benefit, fundraising benefit, whatever it is. Um, typically you need to consider these moving parts and the change that's happening within FDA um, on like a week to week or month to month basis. So uh, that's my background. Um, so uh, my understanding of these is, is like, I, I came prepared to sort of share some, some tips with you, some things that you can do now to sort of prepare a, a regulatory strategy and, and move toward um, like bringing your product to market or, or helping build your, your strategy. And so I, I have a few things lined up to, to talk about, but I also wanna just give people the opportunity to interrupt, ask a question, uh, raise your hand, say like, can you can you clarify more on that point? Um, I I do like to talk, so I'll just keep talking. Uh, so it, I'm sorry if that happens, but please just uh, wave your hand or uh, or yell at the screen, and and we can stop and and have a discussion on something. All right. Um, I, I apologize. I don't have a slide deck, so so you're just gonna have to watch me talk. Uh, but uh, the, the, the first big group of, of advice that I give a lot of companies is, is that they need to do their homework. It sounds obvious uh, to, to say that, but, but a lot of companies, they're, they're experts in their technology, but they don't necessarily become historians of, of that particular area with, with an FDA. Um, FDA is a regulatory body that relies a lot on precedent and to understand what exists and what is cleared and how it was cleared is, is fundamental in, in how you assess your regulatory strategy. Um, and, and so you, you really have to become historians on, on one particular aspect. If it's, uh, if it's biomarkers, there's been a lot of biomarkers out there that do it in, in different mechanisms and you have a new mechanism of doing it, but you really have to understand 
how biomarkers have been viewed in FDA and for what and for what they're doing and what they're claiming. Like you really have to dig into the history of, of a particular product um, in order to understand what your FDA picture might look like. Um, and I'll give you some examples. So everybody knows about risk analyses, right? It's, it's nothing new. It's a, it's a pretty standard practice for new developing technologies. You write your risk analysis, you, you design your studies to address the risks, but, but there's a lot of nuance in that, right? So, so when you dive down in it, you're like, okay, well, we do this a little bit differently. We're using a little bit of a different material. Do we have to do X, Y, and Z study because we're a little bit different? Like it's a marginal change. It's not like a significant change. Like where, where does this take me? And, and, and that's exactly where you can derive some information from, from what, what exists in precedent. Right, so so if if you look at 510k summaries, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, if you look at some some publicly available information, you can usually derive at least a little bit of information about study size, endpoints, like th things that are important to sort of drive. Is this a fifty thousand dollar thing or is this a two hundred thousand dollar thing? Right, it can sort of give you a little bit more flavor as to what direction you're going. And so I always say you've got to be historians on your particular aspect. You've got to do your homework on it. And and the common thing that I hear from people is, oh, we're just going to do a pre-sub. We're going to go to FDA. We're going to do a pre-sub. They're going to tell us. And um, and I always try and tell companies that that pre-subs are, are what you put into it. Like if, if you do your homework and, and put in a good quality submission, you get good quality feedback back to you. But if, if you just sort of in a nebulous send something to FDA, typically you don't get good information back. You get more questions, you get confusion, you get often more requirements that you might not have needed. Um, so, so from my perspective, the only real time to go to FDA for a pre-sub is in two scenarios. One is if there's, a scientific question that doesn't have regulatory precedent, right? So if, if, if you're trying to, to really do something novel that, that really you need agreement from FDA on, on, and buy-in on the scientific thought process. And then secondly, is if you need it for fundraising. So, so oftentimes if you're trying to raise around and trying to get uh, you know, angel investment in, they're gonna say, what has FDA said about this? And, you know, oftentimes you're, you're not at that point. You haven't gone to talk to FDA. And so sometimes actually doing a pre-sub and getting some preliminary feedback on, on your product development cycle, that can help fundraise. Um, so so I, think, I think those are, are the two cases where you would go to FDA and get, get that feedback. But oftentimes if you do your homework and if you become, you know, historians around your area of expertise, a lot of those questions get answered for you. Um, and, and, you know, so, so either you can become a history, historian or you can hire somebody like a regular consultant that, that sort of, they, they are historians in their own right because, you know, that's sort of what we do. Um, are there any questions on that or any, any specifics that people wanna dive into on that stuff? Yeah, I'm wondering if there's a way to look up stuff that was not approved. You mean things that were were shut down by FDA? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think so. I don't think there's a way. Um, okay. Mostly because most most of the time when you write a 510k, for instance, most of the time you tell FDA in your cover letter, you say, you know, keep it in, keep it confidential according to X, Y, and Z of a regulation, which basically says no one can even disclose that you sent a 510k in, right? right? So in theory, everything at FDA is, is under the Freedom of Information Act. So if you think that they might've sent something, in theory, you could, you could ask for it under that uh, Freedom of Information Act, but, uh, but there's no way to tell if somebody has said no to an, a 510k. Um, now for PMAs, if, if they go to an FDA panel, the FDA panel decisions are public. So if, if it's a class three product that's being 
um, judged at an advisory panel, the the panel's decision is public. It doesn't necessarily say what FDA's final decision is because FDA still has to consider the panel's opinion and make a decision. But you know, ninety nine percent of the time, they follow the panel. Jack, in your experience, how many times do companies have to go back to the FDA um, by with the small little changes that they make based on FDA recommendations? Uh, you mean like prior to a to to their first clearance or after the the clearance? After after the first. Um, usually, not very often. Um, at least with with startup companies, right? Because. If, if you're in a startup, you're, you're sort of, once you get your 510K, you're starting to commercialize. You're starting to get initial customers. And so you're not, you're not necessarily as focused on you know, Gen 2 and Gen 3. So you, you tweak your device, but you're not, you're not necessarily seeking a different indication for use. And, and that's really when you would go to FDA. So if, if, if you were a adult device and you wanted to seek a pediatric indications for use, you would have to submit another 510K to get a pediatric application of your product. Um, most of the time, once you get your 510K, you're not really focused on smaller markets. You try and go after the, the bigger one, or in some cases, like a niche, niche market. So you might say, I'm gonna go to neurosurgery or something like that. Um, but you don't necessarily say, I'm gonna go to pediatric neurosurgery, you just target the, the adults. Um, so it's, it's not very common. Uh, but you, you do see it sometimes, uh, most of the time it would be, um, for certain changes to an indications for use, like going to peds or another common one that I see is, um, is going to home use. So I'll often recommend a strategy of if, if you're trying to do a home use product, I will say, okay, if it's never been done in the home you should get a 510k for clinical setting first, like get FDA to, to buy in on your technology and then get them to buy in on shifting that technology to the home setting, right? You know, give it, spoon feed it in a little bit more manageable uh, steps. And so, and so but, but that's part of a strategy, right? Like you're always trying to get to the home use setting. You just take it in two 510k's. Um, okay, well, uh, one of the other one of the other tips that I wanted to uh, provide people, and this is something that I see all the time in startup companies, uh, and something that I constantly re remind people of is don't forget about clinical studies. Like so many small companies say, oh, like I don't need to run a clinical study because I fit into this category, or because this happened or X, Y, and Z. And they, they say, I don't need to run a clinical study. And I'm constantly reminding them that, that your regulatory clearance is not the end game. It's a small piece of the puzzle. And you need to think about your clinical studies from, from a regulatory standpoint, from a manufacturing and quality system standpoint and a commercial standpoint, um, because once you get your clearance, you you have to have references. The next question that you get asked by doctors, who's using it? That's that's literally the next question that you get always. And and so you you need to consider as part of your overall business strategy, not only when are we going to get our 510k, but when is this going to go into a human and who is going to be using this? And the, the closer that you can take that gap. So if, if you're planning your clinical study while you're, you know, developing and while you're doing writing your 510k that gap is going to be very small and it's going to just help you in the commercial process um, and if if you're doing it at that point in time if something uh seismic were to happen to fda like let's say they say we don't like your data you need to run a clinical study guess what now you're ready and you can just sort of sweep in like move it into that regulatory piece so it's a nice backup to have if if you need it um, on the on the pre market side as well. Um. Um, hi, uh, uh, Jack. Sorry, I just wanted to add something too. This is Kellyanne. 
and kind of to tie what you just said to also the qu um, the question that I think Chris had related to um, the interactions that might come after clearance. And I think that, that your tips have been really great because I, I would say like they sound very aligned with what FDA would like to see too, at least from speaking from my experience as a regulatory um, reviewer at one point. But um, one thing that I learned later actually in my time at FDA um, it just because I was mostly focused on the pre-market side was that um, I'm not sure if companies always are aware that they have to interact with FDA on the post-market side too, um, after the clearance. So the idea of understanding that there is a continued conversation with FDA from a standpoint after the clearance, that's very important because um, for example, companies have to register and list. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind as well as um, post-approval studies sometimes. So just things to keep in mind. It, it's so it's so funny because uh, there there are several device companies that have class one products, and they're like, what do what do I need to do because I, I don't need to get a five ten k? And I'm like, well, there there's an entire set of general controls that that you have to do, and and not only that, you also have to do have quality systems in place. Just because you're exempt from getting a five ten k does not necessarily mean that you're quality system exempt. I mean, you can be if you're making a tongue depressor, but if you're making anything interesting, like typically you need to have a quality system in place. Um, so, so there, there, there still are some steps to do um, from a from a product standpoint. There's FDA has a great guidance on like sort of the decision tree on how to understand whether or not you need to go back to FDA or not. So, so in those cases, it, it's more or less following that. Uh, that decision tree, like more often than not, com small companies specifically, they're going to be less less inclined to go back to FDA. But at the same time, usually companies, I mean, COVID is different under the pandemic, but most companies get inspected by FDA within the first year of registering. So, so you get your clearance, you register and list your company, and within a year, you'll likely have an FDA inspection on your hands. And every change that you make has to have a documentation that you followed a process to say, hey, this change is a letter to file uh, versus a new 510K. Um, and so, and so you still have to have sort of like those mechanisms in place, um, even as a small company and almost more, more importantly as a small company, but, um, but yeah, it doesn't necessarily go to a 510k, but there is still interaction there. So um, the the last tip that I have is uh, is that FDA is hum there. It's made up of human beings, <laughs> right? It it sounds obvious, but 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 they're humans. Uh, it's not like it's it's a robot, and uh, it's not like they're. Uh, they're sort of like this nebulous dictator out there. Uh, they're made up of human beings, and specifically, they're they're not necessarily experts in in your device, right? So, with the understanding that that they're human beings, there are a couple things that you that you need to understand when you interact and when you try and work with them. Um, one is you need to be crystal clear in your messaging to them. The the most common thing and the most common issue with pre subs and 510Ks and PMAs is that you write a mess of of a of a document of a submission that just doesn't make sense and raises questions. So you, you really have to focus on the messaging. You have to have a very clear understanding of what your product does, who's using it, what type of patients it is, what sort of effects can be made, and you need to methodically be able to go through that and sort of put it in context for somebody that's never seen it before. So, so I'm often trying to read um, submissions that I get or I, I'm reviewing from the aspect of what if I'd never seen this before? Would I know what this is? Like you say X does Y, but I don't, under, I don't necessarily understand that because I've never seen your product. And FDA, they don't get to they don't, well, sometimes they might, but they don't have the thing to play with. So whatever you're writing down or whatever pictures you're putting in, or if it's a video, whatever it's in, it needs to well describe your product because you're talking to somebody that's never seen it before. And likewise, FDA sometimes gets things wrong. 
um, you know, they're, they're, they're human. They, they're naturally conservative on some of these things because they're, they're, you know, one, one of their mandates is to protect public health. So they're naturally conservative, conservative on a couple aspects. I'll give you an example. Um, Co-op tech went, went to FDA in a pre-sub to say, hey, we have this new feeding tube device. And they basically came back and said, we've never seen this mechanism before. Um, so you're gonna have to do a clinical study on it. And uh, which surprised all of us. And FDA basically wanted a, a five person clinical study to show that it was safe. And we, we, we didn't understand this because one, like what is a five person study gonna show you? basically nothing. It's not statistically driven. It's not anything other than it's just going to be five, five patients that may have gone well or may not have gone well or might have had complicating factors. And so we, we actually went back to FDA and said, instead of doing a clinical study, let's design a, a more robust animal study. Let's, you know, that Co-op Tech uses magnets in their, in their product. And we were like, let's have a super skinny dog because they were worried about compression injury, compression of tissues between the magnets. Let's get a skinny dog. Let's have giant magnets. Let's leave it on there for much longer than what whatever the, the procedural time would be. So let's create a safety factor, design it into the study. Because we're working in dogs, we can do it under endoscopic visualization. So we can have an endoscope watching what's happening and we can provide all this data to FDA and prove that it's not going to hurt anybody. And, um, and so we, we sort of thought about it from a, what is FDA's, what, what, what is FDA's goal? They're trying to make sure that it's safe. They proposed one way. We said, let's, let's try this a different way. Let's try it in a, in a scientifically robust way. And to FDA's credit, when they saw that, they were like, yes, that sounds that sounds like a reasonable approach. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's one example where, where FDA is, is human. They, they, they sort of naturally go to a clinical study as a default. And, and you can sometimes think through and, and prove out their hesitancies by doing a, a, a robust bench top or animal study. Um, the, the other common thing that, that I see a lot is uh, people that are designing something new, they're designing something better than something that doesn't work very well, right? So like take diagnostics, for example, there might be a, a diagnostic panel that is only right 80% of the time. And, and so you're saying, well, why are you trying to compare us to something that's only right four out of five times? Like if, if, if ground truth were, if we were comparing to ground truth, we would be outperforming the competition, but FDA, you're asking us to compare against a predicate device that sucks. Oh, sorry for my language. We, you're comparing to a, a product that doesn't work very well, which is why we're a business in general. And so you try and convey this to FDA and you know, they, they, they have a 510K mechanism where you're supposed to compare to something else. And, and that can be a real challenge for new medical device companies that are saying, how do we, how do we prove this out? Um, so, so in those cases, I usually encourage people to find, find a different way. Like, don't, don't compare yourselves to something bad. Yeah, like maybe, maybe do that analysis, like as a secondary analysis to say, Hey, here's how we we correlate to them, but but in reality, you should be trying to aim to understand the ground truth. Like if it's hypertension, like nail down your criterion that you're measuring, and hone in on that. Try and find the ground truth. Measure the competition device. Measure your device, and then compare yourselves against that ground truth, not against the competition that that might be performing worse. Um, that that's really common for for diagnostics it's it's common for um software based devices that are you know basing off a, a database of, of algorithms like uh 
Like there are companies that are trying to figure out ear infections and throat infections and uh, skin mod nodules and things that you can do on your cell phone. And they're comparing it to like these databases, which give them really good information. But then when they run that same study against the existing stuff in the market, it doesn't look as good. So, so you have to learn how to craft your, your, your story in a way that one, like fits in the regulatory paradigm because, because it's a 510Ks is, is based upon predicate devices and what exists, but also paint yourself in the picture that, that says, look, our performance is good. It's, it's, it's above what is out there. And this is why here's the measures that we did. Here's a scientific study behind it. Um, and, and so that's often a, uh, point of emphasis for, for small companies. Any questions on, on that stuff? Or I, I, I've talked for a long time, so I'm, I'm happy to open it up for general questions as well. Yeah, feel free to jump in or type your questions in the chat. Yeah, I I really enjoyed um all the things you said, Jack. Uh, it's it's really not cut and dry, and there's kind of an art to it um, and reasoning, and um, yeah, that's really fascinating. It's um and it's helpful to know you know real life stories of how things were argued or crafted. Yeah, it's 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 definitely a little bit of a an an art. It's some science yeah. and some art. Um, you you definitely need to. Uh, be able to tell and tell a story right mm -hmm. like um to fda about about what you're doing and why it's important and why why the science makes sense um you know often oftentimes people will you know they'll they'll create a, a benchtop experiment on something and they'll run numbers and they'll be like okay but i just made this on the bench like what is fda gonna think of like this benchtop thing that i that i rigged up mm -hmm. and and you know, it, it's it's important to understand like your how you did it, and if it's scientifically rigorous, like is there variance in your in your scientific setup, like like is it is it showing what you mean to show? Um, and if you sort of um, if if you vet the way that you're doing your science and ask good questions about how it, how an experiment was set up, typically you can you can. Uh, either poke holes in it or or you can determine that it's actually robust and it's something that you could present to FDA. Mm -hmm. um, so so I'm, I'm never worried about people doing bench experiments, um, even even if they rig it up themselves. What I worry about is, you know, if if they don't consider all the variables in it and and the the impact of those variables. Yeah. Yeah, and it was helpful to um, hear your thought process around, you know, how to, you know, how to show safety um, and efficacy in a way that would make sense to the, that's digestible to the FDA, um, because otherwise it's kind of like, you know, it's, it, it does seem like a hurdle. It's like you, you know, throw something in there and you, you, you know, you, you cross your fingers that, that it's a, you know, that it's a 510K or PMA or something. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. really helpful. I was wondering, um, so it, it sounds like, you know, it, it's, it would be very efficient to understand what would be, what, what might happen during the regulatory approval or clearance process, you know, well in advance. So even when we're um, designing the animal studies, we can make sure to cover the variables that would, you know, that would be important. Mm -hmm. um, how early, how, so yeah, so a lot of um, the people on, um, at these meetups are early stage health and med tech entrepreneurs. I know my startup is still at the, you know, we're, we're, built, we're, we're building a prototype right now and, you know, we're preparing to do cadaver tests. The next step would be um, animal tests. How early do you recommend we engage with a consultant like you? So it, it, it depends. So if, if you're doing the cadaver work, to potentially support um, mm -hmm. like a regulatory clearance, you should probably talk to somebody, right? Yeah. Cause, <laughs> cause, yeah. cause, cause you, you need to do those correctly in order for it to yeah. like uh, support a, a regulatory submission. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's important that, that you talk to somebody who, 
who understands what FDA might be looking for. Yeah. Um, certainly, if you're doing an animal study, that's a GLP animal study that that mm -hmm. that's supporting. Yes, definitely talk to a consultant before yeah. investing in. You know, typical. Depending on the animal, they can be they can be very expensive. Yeah. Um. So the the other the other aspect to consider is it it does tie in very much with your fundraising. So mm -hmm. so knowing your regulatory strategy, having having somebody uh, with sort of a regulatory background to, to either say yet yay or nay on a particular mm -hmm. um, strategy certainly helps. Yeah. I will say that a lot of companies really want to be 510k products, which which to me is is a little weird um, because if you look at the the data out there and, and Silicon Valley Bank has has data on this, but but class three PMA products typically those companies get bought before the 510k products do, and and in, in fact those class three products tend to get purchased and bought prior to regulatory approval, mm -hmm. and so if if you as an entrepreneur are thinking hey I have like a a four or five year horizon on this and and I'm looking to get out. Maybe class three isn't the worst thing. You shouldn't necessarily be saying like I have to be a 510k because huh. my angel investor is telling me this. Actually, class three can can give your angel investor like an earlier exit. No. I that's interesting. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I would it's yeah. it's one of these things that you have to sort of um un understand and 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 I'm sorry. I think my internet is breaking up. Oh, you froze for a sec. Yes, I think I think I missed something. Did, were you saying something? Oh yeah, yeah. No, um, I actually didn't know that. That's I, I had not heard it in that in that way before. Um, you know, PMA versus five ten k. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um. So so oftentimes, uh, when most five ten k class two products, they don't actually get bought until after initial sales so mm -hmm. not even after regulatory clearance they also have to get sales so so as a business you have to be prepared for that so you have to you have to think about all all the money that you have to raise in order to get your your initial customer base before you exit um so whereas if you're a class three you almost never have to even consider that because you'll be bought before your before commercial huh. Just like to, to jump in on, on the financial side of things to give everybody a little bit of tidbit when it comes to that is most companies when they're in their infancy stage are kind of planning an idea of when their exit strategy is going to be as Jack said. Um, people have to understand that as you proceed along the line is what is the valuation of your company going to be worth based on what you have where you're trying to go and where you're where you think you're going to get to. Um, and these are the, the parts that when we're dealing with wealth um, can make a huge effect on how people are going to proceed with getting to the next stage. Um, you know, prior to approval versus post approval, the valuation of a company is going to change quite dramatically. And those are the times where, you know, you should, you know, be sitting down with the people that are involved with your company to look at ways in which you can financially, strategically um, build your company and your, your corporation or LLC or whatever it's going to be to plan around that exit strategy to make sure that you can income split, that you can, uh, you know, do a bio to its best features of a, of a way possible prior to, because once, once those approvals have been put in place and once that foundational number of what the corporation will be worth you, you can't go back and change it at that point in time. So a lot of the time, you know, when, when Jack's, you know, talking to people about, you know, where you're going to go, un understand where that strategy is going to lead you, and then take a look at how your corporate structure is actually in existence to say, you know, based on a buyout of, of that price at that place of, of timeline, um, does this match up to what, what our personal financial goals are for the different uh, owners of the company at the same time? Thank you, Chris. Okay. Any any other questions? Any anything else? 
I guess I have a quick one um, about, you know, talking about software and analyzing and what you're providing to doctors. And typically that's combined with something else that's novel that's acquiring the software. So does that, is that like a group submission or does that get split into a technology and then an analysis piece? Uh -oh. oh, I th oh, there he is. You froze for a sec. Jeez, I <laughs> don't know what's going on with my internet. Um, so I, I believe the question was related to software and uh, matching up with a, a software that might be also new a or also independent. That, yeah. The question. A software analyzing data from like a new technology. So whenever you're doing like co-development work, it's always very tricky. Um, and so software is part of that too. Uh, it, it totally depends on the scenario. Um, from it, so sometimes there can be, you know, software APIs that work and there's like sort of this black box of what the software does that the software company doesn't want to tell you because that's sort of like the secret sauce. In some, some cases, there are mechanisms for them to share that information with FDA without them sharing it with the company. That's also confidential. Um, I believe they call them master files, that sort of thing. Kellyanne probably knows better than I do about it. Um, but correct. but there yeah, are- Master files, <laughs> sorry. There, there you go. So, so in theory, like the third party, the software group could provide a master file so FDA can review what the software is doing with the other company necessarily knowing that the second company just needs to prove that the inputs and the outputs match and you know provide the performance, safety, and effectiveness of, of the product. So it's possible, it just gets very complicated. Great, thank you so much. So Jack, um, before we end this, um, can you summarize the three things early entrepreneurs can do right now to get started on the right foot with their regulatory strategy? Yes, so number one is do your homework. Um, along with that, sort of be historians of your own product um, and, and the regulatory picture there. Number two is don't forget about clinical studies because you're gonna need them regardless. So you might as well start planning for them. And number three is that FDA is made up of humans. <laughs> And so remember that whenever you're either writing a submission, interacting with them, sometimes pushing back on them on different things, they're human beings. Sometimes it just takes a phone call to talk to a reviewer. Sometimes it's uh, sitting down with them and, and providing the device um, and letting them play with it. But uh, number three is that FDA is made up of humans. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was really informative. I learned a lot and it was really helpful. So yes, so um, if you're interested in having one hour, uh, free one hour session with Jack, um, email me with what you would like to learn from Jack. Uh, here's my email. And the first person to uh, get in touch with me will win a one hour session. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Great. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Thanks so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.